Romans chapter 1. All right, what we're doing is we're continuing our study of Christianity 101. Last week we looked at sin, and we discovered that we are all sinners. How many of you recognize that you're a sinner? You know that you're a sinner. And I think it's obvious that all of us are, and we looked at the, that what that sin brings is death. And we defined that last week. If you weren't able to be here, be sure and download that off of the website or get a CD. Pastor Nathan has them, Pastor Nathan has them out on the table. This morning, we're looking at the doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of salvation. And I want to read a couple of things for you as we start. This is from Charles Ryrie. Ryrie wrote a book called Basic Theology. Some of you use a Ryrie study Bible. Dr. Ryrie, I think, went home to be with the Lord just this past year. Um, but he said this, soteriology. Now, soteriology is, that's just the big word on the study of theology, or the, the theological study of salvation. Soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, is one of the grandest themes in the Scriptures. It embraces all of time as well as eternity past and future. It relates in one way or another to all of mankind without exception. It even has ramifications in the sphere of the angels. It is the theme both of the Old and New Testaments. It is personal, national, and cosmic. And it centers on the greatest person, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what salvation is, and it's so wonderful talking about it. We're going to look through the Scriptures today, and we're going to discern what the doctrine of salvation is. Why is it necessary, and what does it mean? Ryrie also talked about the importance of salvation. He says this, In only two instances does the New Testament pronounce a curse on Christians for failure to do something. One is not loving the Lord. And let's look at that. 1 Corinthians 16.22. 1 Corinthians 16.22. This is such an interesting verse. The Bible says, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Now, anathema means let him be accursed. All right? Then look what it says, Maranatha. Let him be anathema, praise the Lord. That's pretty tough, isn't it? Let's read that verse again. Let's read it out loud. You ready? If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. So the, what God is saying is if you don't love the Lord, you're going to be cursed. That's what the Bible says. So next, I want you to see this. So we've said that in only two instances does the New Testament pronounce a curse. The other is preaching a gospel other than the gospel of the grace of God. So let's look at that, Galatians chapter 1. And we're going to be all over the Scriptures, so make sure you have access to a Bible. If you didn't bring one, there's one under the chair in front of you. Just look under there, you'll see one. Galatians chapter 1, and look at verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now look at notice what it says. Which is not another, so there's not another gospel. But there be some that trouble you and would... What's that next word? Pervert the gospel of Christ. So let's stop there. And I want to... We're going to read on in that passage, so don't lose that passage. But I want you to see or to understand a little bit of why we need to do a message like this. So in Christianity, um, we're, we're called Christians. That's our title. Our founder is Jesus Christ. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and that we only have salvation through Him. God, or the church, is made up of the church which is His body, is everyone that's saved, and then we meet together in local churches. And then God is a trinity and three persons. First John 5, 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, and if anyone doesn't believe that, then He's Antichrist, as we saw last week from First John. Salvation is by grace through faith. Jesus Christ rose from the dead bodily in the same body that had been crucified. And then the, our authority, our writings are the Bible, 66 books of the Bible. That's our authority, and it's our sole authority. We don't, we don't rely on creeds or councils or anything like that for our authority. We believe in the Bible. That's biblical Christianity. Let's compare that to Jehovah's Witnesses. So our founder was Jesus. Their founder was Charles Taze Russell. The gospel for us, we know what that is. Their gospel is Jesus opened the door for us to earn salvation. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
not by works of, of righteousness, which we have done, but by His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So in the Jehovah's Witnesses, they, they, have, uh, they believe that Jesus opened the door for us to earn salvation. The church and those who are that would make up the body would just be members of their church. And then God is one person, not a trinity. And they believe that Jesus was Michael the archangel who became a man. How about that? Salvation is by keeping the commandments uh, that, and being in their organization. They don't believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. They reject that. And then they have their own writings. Mormonism is founded by Joseph Smith in 1830. The gospel for them is Jesus' atonement plus the laws and ordinances of the gospel. The church is made up of only the members of the Mormon church. They believe in a triad for God. They don't believe in a trinity. Remember what the trinity is, that it is one God, three persons that make up the Godhead. One God. One what? Three who's. Right? One God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They believe that God is a triad. Three different gods. Then they believe that uh, Jesus is the brother of Satan and all people. They believe that salvation is uh, by it's resurrected by grace, but saved by doing works. They don't believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. How many of you didn't know that? How many of you did not know that Mormons reject the resurrection of Jesus Christ? It's not a biblical faith. Um, then, of course, their books are the Book of Mormon, um, Doctrines and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. Um, what about Muslims? Islam was founded by Muhammad around 600 A.D. The gospel is to live by the five pillars of Islam, to pray five times a day, those types of things. Who, who makes up their body? It's members of the mosque and those who submit to Allah. God is the pre-Islamic moon god, not the Trinity. Jesus was a great teacher and a prophet. Salvation is by trying to do more good deeds than bad deeds, but there's no guarantee that you're going to be saved. You can't know. Allah wills it. Inshallah. The resurrection of Jesus, they don't believe in it. Then the Quran, which was written nearly 150 years after his death, and also the, the Hadith. Then, Nation of Islam is an interesting thing. Nation of Islam was founded by Wallace Fard. He was a white man. Called by uh, and Elijah Poole, founded in 1930. The gospel is the black man is God, the original deity. The white man is a devil. Um, the church is members of their mosque. God is... Allah, and that's material, Farrakhan through succession. So they believe that Minister Farrakhan is God. And they believe that Jesus is a mere man, a teacher, or a prophet. And salvation is by trying to do more good deeds than bad. They don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so you know, we're, I, I might do a message that actually breaks down some more of these things to give some more information. But that gives you an idea of why it's really important for us to have a good understanding of what the gospel is. How many of you heard something in those lists that was not true? Right? The problem is we can say, hey, that's not right. But can you actually go to the places in Scripture to defend what the truth actually is? That's what Christianity 101 is about. It's for us as a church to take the time to establish these things. So now, let me give you a warning. Number one, these messages might not be as entertaining or as interesting as some of the others. It's, it's just information that we're going to get. So that means that you have to listen on purpose. So that means, young people, if one of your friends goes to sleep, you have my permission to hit them as hard as you can. <laughs> Look, they're all looking at each other. <laughs> yes! Violence! I love it! Um, no, just listen on purpose, all right? Uh, I, I really, this is vital information for us, and um, I do like to try to be a little bit more entertaining, but this is pretty foundational stuff. So we're just going to go through it, and it's going to be a little bit of work, but I think it's going to be a blessing. Why don't we take a minute and pray? Dear Heavenly Father, you are so good to us, and I'm so thankful that you have offered salvation by grace through faith to anyone who'll believe in you. Lord, it comes down to that. It's as simple as that. Lord, thank you for coming and being born of a virgin, living a sinless life, then dying on a cross to pay for our sin, then being buried for three days and three nights and rising from the dead, proving that you are, were, and always will be God. Lord, thank you that if we believe that and we receive that, that we'll be saved. 
So, Lord, Lord, help us to understand this doctrine of salvation today. Help us to understand how vital it is to our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's dive in. So, here is... Oh, I wanted to finish. We needed to get back to uh, Galatians. All right, so Galatians 1, let's start again at verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, did we just hear some other gospels? All right which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So gospel perverts would be people like Islam, like Muhammad and Charles Taze Russell and Joseph Smith. They're, they're, they're people who perverted the gospel. They're perverters of the gospel. How many of you believe that's biblical terminology? Yes. Okay. Um, look at verse 8. But though we are an angel from heaven, Moroni, whoever, Macaroni, but though we or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. When you're driving into Washington, D.C., from the direction we came in, there's this huge Mormon temple there. How many of you have seen that big Mormon temple that's there? And that is a monument to a false gospel and a false Christ. We need to know the truth. All right, verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. That's damned to hell. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. We don't look to please men. Sometimes people will say, Pastor, the, that, when, that preaching of the gospel, that's offensive to some people. Well, the Bible told us it would be offensive. It is an offense. But to those who believe, it's the power of God. All right, let's go with me to uh, Romans chapter 1. Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why to the Jew first? Because Jesus Christ first preached the gospel to the Jews. That's, that's what's being spoken of there. All right, look with me at Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... Now, confess means to agree with God, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Isn't that a wonderful verse? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed." For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you'll call on the name of the Lord, He'll save you. Amen? Are you excited about that today? Are you thankful that Jesus Christ is willing to hear your prayer and save you, give you eternal life? And He wants to give that to all of your friends and family. That's the precious God that we serve. Now, look at this statement. This is still from Ryrie. Not comprehending clearly the doctrine of salvation can lead to proclaiming a false or perverted gospel. And many statements of the gospel one hears today may well come under this curse. And I want to give you an example of a false presentation of the gospel. God's not mad at you. He wants to be your friend. Just have a relationship with Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. Where is the gospel in that statement? Is there anything about Jesus Christ dying for our sins? and being buried and rise again, rising again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's a false statement of the gospel. You have to be saved from something. And what are we saved from? Sin. 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 All right? Um, yet the grace of God overpowers our unclear presentations, and people are saved in spite of, though not as a result of, an unclear or misstated gospel. How many of you ever gave somebody the gospel and you didn't get it quite right? Has that ever happened to you? Isn't God's grace wonderful? God's grace is so awesome. There are people that are saved through after they hear an inadequate presentation of the gospel because God is awesome. His grace is wonderful. And yet, we have to make sure that we are proclaiming the clear gospel of Jesus Christ because just as people can be saved through a, a misstated presentation of the gospel, there are people that will never be saved because they didn't hear it clearly. Is that fair? Are you with me on that? And I want that to be clear because there are people here in this room, you were saved in a church that didn't preach the gospel as clearly as maybe here or in churches that believe like we do, but you're just as saved as I am. 
Amen? God's grace is wonderful. But that doesn't mean that we need to diminish our presentation of the gospel. We want to be clearer, not less clear. All right? Um, let's go on. So this is J.M. Pendleton. J.M. Pendleton was a Baptist pre preacher in the 1800s. He was very interested in the doctrine of the New Testament church. He actually pastored, I think it was First Baptist Church in Hamilton, Ohio. And um, he was active in, during the Civil War. And he said this in his book on Christian doctrines. Children of wrath are children of sin. And if we are by nature children of wrath, we are by nature children of sin. Man's wretched condition as a sinner and his consequent need of a Savior are also clearly taught. The Bible makes it very clear that we are children of wrath. And that's why Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for us. We need to know that. This is the foundation for the doctrine of salvation. Erwin Lutzer, he was pastor of Moody Church until just this last year. He said, if you are persuaded that Christ did all that is necessary and all that ever will be necessary to bring you to God, you not only will be saved, but know it. And he's, that's from his book, How You Can Be Sure That You Will Spend Eternity With God. But isn't it wonderful that you can know that you have eternal life? How many of you know people that aren't sure whether they can have eternal life? You ask them, if you died today, are you sure that you'd go to heaven? And you get this answer, I hope so. I hope so. Do you know what I can say? I know so. Not because of me, but because of Jesus Christ who gave me not part-time life, but eternal life. Amen. Hallelujah for that. All right. Then, the doctrine of salvation in theology. Now, theology is the study of God. And you can see that here, theo. That's the word God. And then logi. <laughs> that's the study of it. So, the doctrine of salvation in theology proper is referred to as soteriology. That is, it's the study of salvation. Let me ask you a question. What could be more important than that? What could be more important? Um, I can't remember who it was that said it. Oh, uh, Lewis Sperry Schaefer. Lewis Sperry Schaefer was the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary. And he believed that 75% of the pulpit ministry ought to be preaching the gospel. And 25% uh, building people up in the faith. Isn't that an interesting thought? 75% preaching the gospel. Now, I don't quite agree with that because I think you end up with people that don't know the Bible as well as they ought to. But I can tell you this. I don't know if you've ever been to Grace. I don't know if this is your first time here. But here's something that you will hear. You'll hear the gospel in every message. Every children's lesson includes the gospel. Every message, Lord willing, and maybe, maybe I forget sometimes, and forgive me if I'm making a false statement, but our intention is every service to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every message present the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I suppose that we actually would say to Lewis Berry Schaefer, yes, 75%, but maybe 100%. And then go on and teach other things. But, the, the, but what could be, how is that for a stumbling statement? What could be more important than that? Doug Stauffer, he's our friend, he wrote this book, Let Freedom Ring. He said this, Salvation is the most important issue in this life, and certainly in the life to come. If you're not saved, all other pursuits and concerns cannot compare to this issue. Salvation delivers a person from the penalty, power, and presence of sin. Isn't that wonderful? That's what salvation is. So now let's go to the Scriptures and get some basic observations concerning New Testament salvation. And that is, number one, we need a biblical understanding of the word salvation. A biblical understanding. So we're going to get a dictionary understanding in a minute. But I want us to look through the Scriptures and try to find out what does the Bible mean when it talks about salvation. So salvation in Scripture. Salvation is, first of all, deliverance from death. It is, first of all, deliverance from death. Look with me at the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 14, second book in the Bible. By the way, while I was driving, I was thinking, and I, I started reciting the books of the Bible. I think I do actually know the books of the Bible after I said that. I think I know them. I might have them out of order in a few places, but I think I know them all. All right, look at Exodus chapter 14 and verse 12. Jacob said to me, we're driving down, I can't believe you don't know that. He was so disappointed in his father. Exodus chapter 14, look at verse 12. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt? saying, Let us alone, for that we may serve the Egyptians. 
For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. They were so faithless, weren't they? This is children of Israel coming out of Egypt. They're mad at Moses. Verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more. What are those next two words? Forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And what did God do? He lured them into the Red Sea and then drowned them. That's the salvation. God gave them salvation, physical salvation. Um, then, next, and there's some other verses there that you can write down. So, in Scripture, salvation is, first of all, deliverance from death, but second, rescue from death, danger, or threat. Rescue from death, danger, or threat. Look with me at 1 Samuel. First Samuel chapter 14. So, Jonathan is, needs to be rescued. All right, Jonathan, the son of Saul, the friend of David. So, look at First Samuel chapter 14 and look at verse 45. And the people said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die? Who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid, as the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, that he died not. So salvation has to do with deliverance from death and rescue from danger and threat. It's also associated with mercy. With mercy. Look at Psalm 119. I got this from Dalton Robertson, and he does such an amazing job of defining biblical words in their use in Scripture. This is, it's really neat. So, mercy. Um, Psalm 119, look at verse 41. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. Man, we can't be saved without mercy, the mercy of God. Then, protection. From the harm of the enemy, protection from the harm of the enemy. Psalm one night or Psalm one forty, verse seven. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. Now we often pray for whether it's our police, our fire, our military, those who are from the people that we love, that God will bring them protection. That's a form of salvation that God gives. So what we're seeing so far, that salvation is deliverance from death, it's rescue from danger, it's associated with mercy, it's protection from the harm of the enemy, and then it's refuge from storms. Look at Isaiah 25, 4. Isaiah chapter 25, and look at verse 4. The Bible says, For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the, to the needy in distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Drop down to verse 9. The Bible says, and it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. Refuge from storms. All right? So what do we see from the Bible? We see that salvation is deliverance, it's rescue, it's mercy, it's protection, and it's refuge. All of those things. Now, Let's try to get a dictionary definition. This is from Webster's 1828 Dictionary, Salvation. The act of saving, preservation from destruction, danger, or great calamity. How many of you think that hell would be a great calamity? So you've got to be saved from something. Um, when Voltaire died, the, the skeptic, someone came to his bedside and said, Have you made peace with God? And he said, I didn't know we had ever quarreled. 
the Bible lets us know very clearly that we have a problem with God. And it's called sin. We need to be saved from it. Continuing the definition from Webster, appropriately in theology, the redemption of man from the bondage of sin and liability to eternal death and the conferring on him of everlasting happiness. This is the great salvation. How about that from Noah Webster? Is that a great definition? You all need to get that. You need to, to go to Webster's 1828 Dictionary Online, punch in salvation, get this and tattoo it to your forehead. All right? This is such a great thing. Appropriately in theology, the redemption of man from the bondage of sin and liability to eternal death and the conferring on him of everlasting happiness. This is the great salvation. Now, young people, I know young people like tattoos. That was a joke. I don't want to see any of you come in with a tattoo on your forehead. That's generally called the mark of the beast. All right, let's go on. All right, so now we're not going to look up these passages, but this is in Webster's definition. Hasn't the world changed? So if you had a dictionary in school for a hundred years, this was your definition of salvation. Look at what it says. Deliverance from enemies, victory, Exodus 14. Remission of sins or saving graces, Luke 19. The author of man's salvation, Psalm 27. A term of praise or benediction, Revelation 19. That's what the word salvation meant. Man, the world has changed so much. Can you imagine someone saying that you can't have God in school? When the foundation of our educational system was this, right here. It's an amazing thing. All right, so let's go on. A theological definition now. So we looked at just a general definition, a dictionary definition. This is from Cairns. It says, The comprehensive term to describe the complete deliverance that God, through the person and work of Christ, and by the operation of the Holy Spirit, gives to His people. The comprehensive term to describe the complete deliverance that God, through the person and work of Christ, and by the operation of the Holy Spirit, gives to His people. It includes all the other soteriological terms. That's any term dealing with salvation. Regeneration. So what is regeneration? New birth. It's regeneration. Conversion. That's when you were lost, now you're saved. You're converted from a hell-bound sinner to a heaven-bound saint. That's conversion. Justification. That's the legal declaration where God declares you not guilty. That happens at salvation. Adoption. This is the wonderful thing. That means, see, Roman adoption, we got to understand when Paul wrote the book of Romans talking about adoption, the way that they understood that is when you're adopted, you are equal in the family of God to every other person in the family of God. More importantly, you're equal with the Son of God. You're an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Adoption is a wonderful thing, isn't it? It is a wonderful thing. Then, sanctification. That is the process whereby the Holy Spirit makes you like Jesus Christ. And ultimately, according to the book of Philippians and others, the book of Romans, what happens when you're saved is the Holy Spirit begins making you more and more like Christ. And then ultimately, when you get that new body and the resurrection then you become exactly like Jesus Christ. That's sanctification. That ha that's the process of salvation. And not the, let me make this very clear. Sanctification is a process that happens after salvation. Salvation is not a process. Salvation is an exchange that takes place at a point in time. All right? Sanctification is the process. So, but soteriology includes all of that. And then glorification. Glorification is when you get a body like Jesus Christ's body, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All right? And so that's what... A theological definition of salvation is. So now let's try to get a practical understanding of it. All right? So salvation is from sin and death. Now that word from is very important. It is from sin and death. How many of you were lost? Would you raise your hands? You were. How many of you are now saved? And you have been saved from sin and death. It is wonderful. There is not a chance in the world that I'm going to go to hell. But if you're not saved, there's only one place you're going, and that's hell. So get saved. Get saved. It's wonderful. Salvation is from sin and death. All right? Let's look at that. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. All right? So Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. We looked at this last week. So this is talking about Mary, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. What are those next three words? From their sins. We have to be saved from something. Look at 2 Corinthians 
chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In verse 10, the Bible says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Now look at this. Not to be repented of. So when you're saved, that salvation, you can't... God will not change His mind about that, all right? For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. So what does that mean? How many of you have ever seen somebody that got caught and they were sorry they got caught? You know what I'm talking about? They're not sorry for their deed. They're sorry that they got caught. All of you school teachers, you see that all the time. I remember I got caught. I've probably told you this a thousand times, but I was in sixth grade, I think, and I, it, I lived in Connecticut and it was against law to have firecrackers. Then, like a genius, I took a pack of firecrackers to school. <laughs> And we were doing some project, and you know we were gathered around some desks, and I was up on my knees, leaning forward, and I had this pack of firecrackers sticking out of my back pocket, and the teacher came by and just snatched them out. And I think that's stealing. I think that teacher should have gotten in trouble for taking it. But she snatched my firecrackers. What are these, Mr. Alter? And so I get go sent to the principal's office, and I'm sitting there. The next thing I hear from the school secretary is, "Hello, Reverend Alter. We need to come. We need you to come and pick up your son." because I was suspended. And honestly, I wasn't really that sorry for the firecrackers, but I became very sorry that I got caught. <laughs> Just fill in the blanks right there. I think that you can understand. When a person genuinely recognizes their sin debt and that they are responsible to a holy God for every sin that they've ever committed, that ought to lead to godly sorrow and repentance. The Bible talks in the book of Acts that what they were preaching, repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. You repent about what you have believed about God and your sin, and you confess the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and that's salvation. But if you don't repent, if you don't come to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says here that the sorrow of the world worketh death. All right, so salvation is from sin and death. Man's problem is his sin. So let's run through this quickly. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, verse 23. I think most of us can quote this, but let's read it out loud. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the wages of sin, your wages are what you get for what you do. What you get for sin is death. That's what you have earned, all right? So man's problem is sin. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Man's problem is sin. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 24. This is such a powerful passage of Scripture. We looked at it last week. John 8, 24, the Bible says, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. Jesus Christ said you have to believe that He is God. I am. You have to believe that. If you don't believe that, you're going to die in your sins. That's what Jesus Christ said. So man's problem is his sin. In 1689, the Baptists in London put together a statement of faith, and the purpose of this London Confession, is what it was called, was to demonstrate to the state church that they weren't heretics, all right? that they were orthodox. That was the purpose of this creed. But I want you to see, or the London Confession, I should say. I want to read some of it to you. They said, they, Adam and Eve, our first parents, being the root, and by God's appointment, standing in the room instead of all mankind, the guilt of sin was imputed, all right, imputed, that is put on them, and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity, descending from them by ordinary generation, that's birth, being now conceived in sin and by nature children of wrath, the servants of sin, the subjects of death, and all other miseries, spiritual, temporal, and eternal, 
unless the Lord Jesus set them free. Amen? Let's see how He sets us free. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. Can I tell you something? The trite um, pop culture statements of Christianity, don't they pale in comparison to something like that 1689 confession? Which is more powerful and, and meaningful? You know, it's, it's so interesting, the difference. All right, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, look at verse 10. Um, verse 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, look at this, which not will deliver us, but which delivered us from the wrath to come. Aren't you glad if you're saved, you're delivered from the wrath to come? So that's the statement from the London Confession. Um, Number three, salvation is exclusively the work of Christ. So how do, how do we get saved? Well, you can't do it. Jesus Christ has to do it. Let's trace that through the Scriptures. It is exclusively the work of Christ. Look at Acts chapter 4. Man, I love these young people. They're moving ahead because of the on the screen. That's fantastic. Can I ask you a question? How many other churches in Sydney do you think are the teenagers... Turning Scriptures, establishing the doctrine of salvation. Man, I love it. Thank you, young people. You guys encourage me so much. Acts chapter 4, look at verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's just Jesus. You know, there are people who believe that it, as long as a person you know, is trying to do right, they don't have to have, know the name of Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. The Bible says you have to know the name of Jesus Christ to be saved. What about those who have never heard? Well, number one, you need to go tell them. Amen? Number two, God is gracious. According to Romans chapter 1, He gives them the light of creation. If they respond to the light of creation, God has written His law in their hearts. Romans chapter 2, the light of conscience. If they'll respond to the light of creation and the light of conscience, God will send them, Romans 3, the light of Christ. I can give you example after example of people who have responded to those first two and God supernaturally sent the light of Jesus Christ to them. We have a great and merciful and saving God. But remember, we are a part of that process. The Bible says that we are His ambassadors. Is that what the Bible says? But we have to go in order to be able to do that. All right, not only do we have Acts chapter 4, look with me at John chapter 14. I think some of you might know this. Why don't we start reading in verse 1. I love this passage of Scripture. John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. It's funny, modern translations say many apartments. How many of you are excited about getting an apartment? <laughs> in My Father's house is many, a lot of public housing. Um, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one way to heaven. Salvation is only by the Lord Jesus Christ. We must believe that. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 4. It's speaking about... Uh, why don't we read verse 3? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, 
who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He gave himself a ransom for who? For all. There is only one way to be saved, and that is through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, number three. Number four. Let's move on. Salvation is accomplished by grace through faith. Salvation is accomplished by grace through faith. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, let me say something. This is very important. Go, y'all go ahead to Ephesians 2. But this, this section right here might be the most important section for all of us living in this Miami Valley. Because most of the people who identify themselves as Christian believe in a works salvation. How many of you know that that's true? So this section, it's vital that you get these verses down, that you know them, that you memorize them, that you're able to take people to them. It's vital. So Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is not of works. Now let me ask you a question. Is that unclear? So anyone who disagrees with that, they're disagreeing with the Bible. Okay? So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And look at verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. How? Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. All right? You believe the truth and the Holy Spirit sanctifies you, changes you. Salvation is only by faith through grace. Look at Romans chapter 11. <coughs> Look at verse 5. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, the election of grace, don't let... Calvinism has redefined Scripture. All right? So, election of grace, the elect in the Bible is very clearly Jesus Christ is the elect, Romans or uh, Isaiah chapter 40. Israel is the elect, Isaiah chapter 43. And anyone who is in Jesus Christ is the elect, Ephesians chapter 1. And so that's, don't, don't be confused by what other people say about election. The Bible tells us what it is. Ephesians chapter, or, or I'm sorry, uh, look at verse 5 again, Romans 11, verse 5. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now look at, and if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more of grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. If we understand what work is, that can't be grace. Grace is a gift. If we understand what grace is, it can't be a work. The Bible makes it very clear that salvation is accomplished by grace through faith. Look at Galatians chapter 2. Look with me. At verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You know, there are people that think that by obeying certain rules, they can go to heaven. If that was true, then Jesus Christ died in vain. He died for nothing. That's certainly not true, is it? No. All right, look with me at Titus chapter 2. And look at verse 11. The Bible says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. All right? So, salvation is by grace, through faith, and it's for everyone. Then, let's move on. Number five, salvation is accomplished by faith 
which is produced by God's Word. Where does this faith come from? We believe that salvation is by grace through faith. Where does the faith come from? And we're, look, look, I want to look at a few verses, and I'll make a comment about that. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 1. And look at verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So God predestinated, he ordained before the foundation of the world, that anybody who trusts in him will be in Christ. All right? That's, is that what the verse says? It's, it's very clear. Now, look at what it says, verse 12, "...that we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise." So what did you believe? You believed after you heard the gospel. What's the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the Scriptures. All right? Look with me. So what we're seeing here is that salvation is accomplished by faith, which is produced by God's Word. Look at Romans chapter 10. Where does this faith come from? How many of you know the answer to this already? If you know the answer, say amen. 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 Look at verse 17. Honestly, how many of you were kind of quoting this verse in your head before I turned there? Isn't that a blessing? All right. The Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. One of the problems with some of the modern evangelistic methods is they don't take people to the Scriptures. They try to teach them principles. But faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. What you need to do is just quote the Bible, quote the Bible, quote the Bible, quote the Bible. Point people to Scripture, point people to Scripture. I've mentioned to you before how I saw John MacArthur on Larry King. And he was there with a Methodist pastor, and he was a liberal Methodist pastor, didn't believe the Scripture, and a Catholic priest, and then Deepak Chopra. And so Larry King would ask a question about some part of theology or salvation, and all these guys are pontificating, and MacArthur would just sit there. And then he said to uh, MacArthur, he said, John, what do you believe? MacArthur said, doesn't matter what I believe. The Bible says, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Every time, he'd just sit there and quote Scripture. And man, I think Chopra was demon-possessed or something, man, because he started squirming and doing all kinds of weird stuff every time MacArthur started quoting Scripture. It is amazing the power that the Word of God has. Man, you want to freak out a liberal, open the Bible. (laughs) It is so true, the power of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 15. This is Paul writing to Timothy. He says this, "...and that from a child thou hast known the holy Scriptures..." Look at what it says. "...which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus." Now, is that a clear statement that salvation is by faith and faith comes by the Word of God? That is the clear teaching of the Bible. All right? So, salvation is accomplished by faith, which is produced by God's Word. Then, number six, salvation is unto good works. We're not saved just to save us from hell, and so we can sit in a cloud and play a harp someday. That's not why we're saved. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, let's look at verse 10. Let's, why don't we get the context? We read the, ver- the two verses before it. Let's see what it says. For by grace are you saved through faith. That's verse 8. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. What are those next three words? Unto good works. We're not saved by good works. We're saved unto good works. All right? For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. All right? So we're saved unto good works. Now, 
Here's something that's really important. We're not going to go to the Philippians passage today. When we say that we're saved by faith and that that faith comes from hearing the Word of God, is it then surprising that Satan would try to undermine the Word of God? When you try to persuade someone that God's words are important, you are fought by you are fought against by evangelical Christians. So if you have two Bibles, you have one Bible that says one thing, and you have another Bible that says something else in thousands of places, how can you say that's unimportant? And it undermines things. Next Sunday morning, I'm going to bring a message called Salvation and the Modern Translations. Salvation and the Modern Translations. I want everyone to see how vital this subject really is. It's very important that we understand that God not only inspired His Word, but He wrote it down. He had it written down, and then He preserved it. Do you know that there are evangelicals today who say there's no such thing as the doctrine of preservation? How many of you think that undermines faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God? Seriously. Doesn't that undermine it? It's a very faithless position. We start with faith. We start with faith in the Word of God. And then we learn everything else from that. It's vital. We have an authority. I'm not the authority at Grace Baptist Church. The Word of God is the authority. And I am correct only where I correctly articulate the Scriptures. That's it. That's our authority. The Bible is our sole and only authority. So I want to ask you a question. If you're here today and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, where does the Bible say that you're going to go? Hell. Hell. Eternal torment. If you're saved, where do you go? You go to heaven. You've only got two choices, heaven or hell. There's nothing in between. You might say, well, I don't believe that. Your belief has absolutely nothing to say about reality. It's like gravity. I can say I don't believe in gravity. And like we saw with Frank Turek, if I say I don't believe in gravity, do I then float away? Jim, come back! Just believe! You'll come back! Is that the way it works? No, my belief in gravity says nothing about gravity. It just says a lot about my common sense or my understanding of reality. You saying that you don't believe what the Bible says about your eternal destiny says nothing about your eternal destiny. It's very important that you get this. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you ever called on the name of the Lord for salvation? How many of you have done that? You know for sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior. If you have not done that, today is the day of salvation. Do you know you're not, you're, you're not promised to make it through this day? You might die on the way home. You might have a heart attack. You might go to a local restaurant and choke to death. The Bible says, What is life but a vapor? that appeareth for a little time, then vanisheth away. The Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. We're not promised another breath. If you died today, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? I love 1 John 5.13. The Bible says, For these are written to you that believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know that you have eternal life. But 1 John 5.11 says, there's only two kinds of people in the world. There are those that believe on the name of the Son of God and those who don't believe on the name of the Son of God. Those who believe have life. Those who don't believe don't have life. There are only two kinds of people. Which kind of person are you? Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone? Now listen, it's very important that you get this. If you're trusting in your baptism, you're trusting in something other than the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're trusting in your church membership, you're trusting in something other than the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're trusting in your good works, you're trusting in something other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that clear? Seriously. Is that clear? So if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. What does that mean? You believe that you're a sinner and that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins 
And he rose from the dead, proving that he was, is, and always will be God. If you'll believe that and accept that, ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, he will save you. But if you think that any of those other things I listed will take you to heaven, or anything else you might be trusting in, you're not going to go to heaven. We saw it in Acts chapter 4. There's none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. That's it. So if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, do it today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus Christ to save you, I want to help you to do that today. I want to lead you in a prayer that will help you receive Christ as your Savior. But it's very important that you understand that reciting a prayer has never saved anyone. We read earlier in the book of Romans that you believe in your heart and then you confess with your mouth. If you believe the prayer that I'm going to lead you in, then you'll be saved. If you don't believe it, you won't be saved. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, unless you have believed in vain. You can believe in vain, but if you really believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and you want Him to save you, He'll save you right now. Just pray this if you've never prayed it. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I deserve to go to hell. Please forgive me for my sin. I know that I can't save myself. I know that I can't be good enough to go to heaven. Please forgive me. I believe that you're God and the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sin. I deserve to go to hell because of my sin. I'm so sorry for it. Please forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sin. But I also believe that you rose from the dead and that you are God. And I am asking you today to be my Savior. I'm calling on you today. I believe in you. If you just prayed that, no one's looking around, just me.